I've been talking a lot actually about Beethoven this year. So 32 piano sonatas, and it's just the most important body of works for piano repertoire and an exploration in form, compositional techniques, drama, pianism, symphonic aspects of the piano. Um, and as Johannes said, it's like an exploration of his life, an exploration of the humanity and the culmination of everything that he had done with the piano sonatas present in the last one. And for me, it was just personally very meaningful because I played this Opus 111 for my doctorate audition at uh, IU. And um, funny story, uh, if any piano student is listening to this, um, you know how it starts at this register, right? Can you hear my piano sound okay? Yeah? Okay. I started like this. <laughs> because I was so nervous. And you know, I just kept playing without noticing what I was doing. And so Mr. Pressler had to just sort of chuckle to stop me. And then I had to start all over again. But I played fine after that. And um, I got into the doctorate program just okay. Yeah. Anyway, so. Uh, you are not point. alone, GA, because yeah? in one of the concerts I had, I ended, I finished with the wrong register chord. I think okay. I played another <laughs> higher. <laughs> so. so it's not just me, you know. Under yeah, yeah, you're not alone. <laughs> right. But, you know, but then after that audition, I never played it again. I never performed it again. I played 109 much more. But then, you know, as we are going through this difficult year, I'm thinking about, you know, what, what's the meaning of all this? As musicians, when we can't perform to connect with other people, what can we possibly do? And when you're under so much pain and stress and just adversity in general, how do we overcome this? And I think Beethoven showed us how he sort of overcame a lot of his just agony in his life. And um, he presents us with this transcendental kind of work. So I think I will try to show you how the piece starts and how he transcends into peace, basically. Okay, so. In order to talk about Opus 111, I think we need to look at the very first one, how different it is, right? It's still in minor. It has the sonata allegro form, but it's so simple. There's a little pause, there's a little drama, but it's very just simplistic kind of 4-4, four, four, or no, it's 2-4. Um, no, what is it? <laughs> Cut time. <laughs> it's still too early. Um, and, you know, nothing complicated or complex like what we saw in the first movement introduction of the 111. And the last movement, and then there is the slow movement. And the last movement is just, you know. <laughs> Again, cut time, it's fast, it's in ronda form. So anything that's kind of typical that you would expect from the sonata is present. But then he started doing some wild things. Um, for example, in the Moonlight Sonata, this is sometimes viewed as the beginning of the romanticism because it's just pushing so many boundaries. Uh, in the first movement alone, it's slow. And it's kind of hard to figure out where is my fast, first theme looking thing, okay? And um, everything here in Italian, what's written is all the way through damper pedal. Basically, that's what it's saying. So, you know, on the modern piano, that's very weird thing to do, but I think it might have been possible and quite magical on his piano. But anyways, it's a wild concept to put down the damper pedal for such a long time, blurring all the harmonies. And then there is a wild technique here, you know, this glissando octave that you don't see anywhere else. And the evidence is the fingering here, five, 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 and then one, one, one. So I don't think he means like that because of the tempo and the slur. Anyway, so that's very wild. 
And here you see the beginning of his use of the structural extended. And then you have the... Um, punctuated melody with the extended trill. So trill is usually what? Used as a credential gesture, right? To finish a harmonic progression, five to one. That's how a lot of classical composers use trill. But in the late sonatas of Beethoven, trill becomes something else. So that has been just in my mind for a long time. And what is, what is he doing with the trills and why? And I don't have a complete answer, really clear answer, but I have my theory or understanding of it. Okay, now Johannes already talked about how you know, unhappy his life was basically, but just a little more on that. So one 1802 is um, when he was about 31, 32, he made this letter, he wrote this letter known as Heiligenstadt Testament that he never sent to anyone. It wasn't published, but it was discovered after his death. And basically the letter is, it's really sad to read. I encourage you to um, look at it. It's so tragic and just, you know, how he feels misunderstood and how difficult his life is and how the deafness is affecting him and so on. But after he didn't send it, he wrote <laughs> the symphony number three. So already he's, you know, he's suffering, but he wants to, I think, do something about it. I think that was his nature all along. Now, 1822 is when he um, apparently accepted that nothing could be done. I'm going to be deaf for the rest of my life. And that is exactly when he wrote the Opus 111. So for me, it's like the acceptance and the resignation and making peace of his fate with his fate. Okay, now to illustrate just how he reacts to the difficulty with his music is this example of his illness in um, 1824. To five, he had really serious illness on top of the deafness. I think it was some kind of intestine internal kind of problem. And when he got over that sickness, that's when he wrote the quartet opus 125. And that is a very famous example of this. It's the title is Heiliger Dank Gesang. And it's the thankfulness, the song, song of thankfulness after recovering from this um, illness. So it starts with. very beautiful F major or the Lydian mode kind of um, slow choral like sort of like a prayer um, melody and then in the middle of that you hear this in three kind of happy joyful moment where he finds just the strength again and he's very thankful about that strength so that's how he sort of responded to that difficulty and sickness he had so so much struggle in his life and how does he overcome and how does he show it in his music that has been my interest during this year okay um now, just a little bit about his late piano sonatas. As Johannes discussed, the extremity in everything, basically. That is the pinnacle. That is the very, very important element of the late sonatas in register, texture, tempo, contrasts. Everything he did already, but like much, much more. Fantasy elements. So again, that's not just for the late sonatas, but it's more extreme slow introduction, quick changes, 
improvisatory elements and unmeasured notes that are improvisatory. So those are all the elements of the fantasy, right, in Baroque periods. And that appears often in his later piano sonatas. Movement in variations, again, not new. Mozart did it too, even. And then um, in earlier sonatas, like, um, Sonata has a slow movement in variations. 109 has it, 111 has it. And then these guys marked with the orange letter, those are the most important ones. Um, fugal and contrapuntal elements and extended trills. Those are the two very, very prominent features of these 101, 106. 109, 110, and 111, the last five sonatas. Okay, now um, let me show you a couple examples of those. Let's see. Opus 101, last movement, has a fugue. Okay, so. A weird key but that's the um, fugue subject and then the counter subject here that, 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 that. so that is 101 and then we have 106 with a long trill <laughs> Melody punctuated with an extended trill as a part of an important area, important element of the, this is the first movement, right? And then in the same sonata, we have fugal element too uh, in the same movement. So... So this texture, contrapuntal texture, is a very big contrast from the massive beginning that is more homophonic. Okay, now the most interesting aspect of 106 is the trill as a subject in the fugue. So trill becomes actually an element of a theme. Um, so that's what you see in 106, and 109 has this long trill that starts from the low register. And then also in the uh, first movement, no, not first movement, the second movement variation has. Fugal section, and then you have. the position of the trill, right? Long trill was in the very low register, now it's in the very high register. And if you look at the score, you know, it has a lot of the stuff that Beethoven does all the time. Arpeggios, scales, broken harmonies. These are the necessary techniques in his earlier sonatas. All of them use this, but just in the later ones, they're more used in extremity or in combination with other things. Um, Opus 110, last movement, is fugue. But this is the only one among the five that doesn't have the long structural trill. Okay, so remember that. It might appear in the question. <laughs> okay, now we can move on to 111. Um, the beginning, you know, sometimes I use it for outreach lectures that I do for little kids, you know, and then I play this and then I ask, what does this sound like? Does it, or how does it make you feel? Do you think you can predict what's coming? 
So those are some questions that I would like you to think about, you know, if you don't know the piece just well enough yet, when you hear something like that, this diminished dropping, and you are not so sure because it's a 32 second upbeat. And so what's my meter going to be? What is the music going to do? And and what's going to happen, right? So it's just suspension after suspension. Like you don't know what's going to happen. He keeps us just very this is the third time, right? So you might think, I think he's gonna resolve something here, right? But he doesn't. Right? It just keeps going with a tie and another tie and another tie. And, and then what comes is what Johannes talked about, you know, the syncopation. So that, uh, for example, syncopation is almost like he's resisting something, you know, and it's a struggle. This full page is struggle, I think. The darkness of life that Johannes talked about, it's just the full of life's agony, you know, with the harmony and then the unexpectedness and the tied notes blurring the rhythmic aspect of it and the pauses, right? And then he goes into this rumble. You still don't know what the meter is going to be, but from here, you hear one, two, three, four, right? So you feel somehow oriented for the first time um, because it's a little more measured and it's allegro, right? So you get a little bit of what you expect in the first movement sonata form. Um, so if you think about how it began, it had double dotted rhythm, right? In slow tempo, okay? And then it had some pauses and sort of like a improvisatory quality um, like this. That's very like made up in the moment kind of music. So slow dotted rhythm, double dotted rhythm in 4-4 four, four, and then improvisation kind of quality. Then it goes into more measured allegro and it has a fugal element. Um, so all of that points us to something in Baroque area, okay? So that was actually one of my exit exam, the oral exam for my doctorate studies. A professor asked, so what does that sound like to you? And I got it right. It's the French overture. If you know any of the French overtures by Bach, this movement is very much like that. So um, he's pulling a lot of the old elements, you know, including the fugal aspect, but French overture is what this first movement is very similar to. Now, after this, what I want you to remember is how the first movement, Allegro section begins. It's G to C, okay? So it's a rising fourth. Now, let's just look at a couple examples of the improvisatory quality and the extremity. So here you have, whoops, sorry. But what am I doing, right? It's so crazy to go like up and down like this and then. Meno allegretto, meno allegro. It's so bizarre to have this kind of momentary wandering, right, in the first movement of a sonata form. 
Um, and then Johannes already showed you what's going on on this page, right? The unism, and then you have contrapuntal structure. So many things are going on. But just remember that there was some kind of fugal element going on here. Now, I'm going to just play. You already heard, but just to remember how the first movement began. Full of diminished chords, full of agony, unexpectedness, and so much struggle. Then it finishes how? So here this harmony is what we had in the very beginning, right? And that leads you to ascending somewhere right compared to how dark and struggling the beginning was you have this C major chord in very soft dynamic and measured not like off the beat by 30 seconds in the very beginning okay after that sort of oh where am I going am I going up you get this serene adagio cantabile semplice theme. Um, so if you remember how the first movement allegro began, right? It's the dropping fourth. So it's very closely related, but the opposite. It's major and it's dropping. And um, some theorists suggest, so now I want you to hear, that was also the beginning of the Allegro section, right? Not just, so that's the G to C, but then there is the, so here, C, So there is a little bit of an overarching major version of that theme from the first movement. So the point is that they are very related, but the second movement does something completely different. Okay, um, let me see. Let's go back to... So then after the introduction of that beautiful choral-like serene theme, he goes into rhythmic subdivision, right? So you started with eight followed by 16th note. Here you have constant 16th note sort of dividing the beat. And then you have here even smaller division, right? And a little faster division. And then we hear <laughs> this strange kind of um, section that Johannes connected with. Maybe it's like the childhood that he never had. But to me, I mean, I, yeah, I never thought about it as a childhood thing, but it's the extreme joy that either he hoped for or he felt when he was writing this music. But um, anyways, this kind of technique, again, is very Beethovenian, you know, because that's what he does in the Appassionata second movement and a lot of other pieces too. This is called diminution variation when you go into subdivision and then subdivision of the subdivision. So that's what's going on because this is just getting to be more joyful as the variation goes on. So you get more. So this 
variation was the hardest for me when I was learning it because I was like, what is he doing? What? I, this is so weird. That's how I felt. But then, like about 15 something years later, maybe longer, it is the joy, the extreme kind of joy that he had with this music. And a lot of people get confused with this because um, it's so jazzy, right? And boogie woogie like. <laughs> But that's much, much later than this music. So this syncopation that we associate with jazz music here means something different. It's just about the happiness and the extreme joy that he's showing us. And then after that extreme joy, what he does is just so peculiar because this is this low rumbling business. So on the piano, if you can imagine, like why is he doing this long tremolo figure in the left hand, so low? And after that, why is he going? So thin, right? If you think about like, this thick texture in the beginning, here it's so bare, it's so soft, so high, what is he doing? So here's another link I will share actually in the chat room. Um, let's see, I read this article recently and this is written by another composer actually who has hearing disability, hearing impairment. Gabriela Lena Frank is her name and um, she talks about Beethoven's piano music especially, because she's a pianist too, I think. Um, why did he do that? The extremity is what she's talking about, and that comes from the hearing impairment. I think the whole world changes, and she says when she's not wearing hearing aid, that's when, he write, when she writes this like more contrapuntal, more abstract, or very, very thin textured music. So I think that's what's going on. Like when he does something like this, it's more about the concept of sound that he couldn't hear. So it's either really thick and busy and heavy and loud or thin and soft like this. And the abstract form, the most abstract form of the classical music is really the fugue, right? So the counterpoint comes in a lot as he gets older because of that reason. Um, okay. After the extremity and the long extended trill. Oh, and you know, if you go back here, he did that in major. And then here you do. A minor. So he does the major and then the minor. So things just keep contrasting with each other. So there is a contrast between first and second movement. And then within the second movement, you have this joy, low, higher register, minor. Just it keeps conflicting almost with each other. Now, after this long trill, what comes here, you know, is that extreme register that Johannes talks about. We have a section of E flat major, right? With lots of syncopation. If you can think about other E flat major works that Beethoven wrote, what are they like? It's usually very heroic, right? That or... But here, what we have is it's nothing like that, right? It's very subdued, not heroic, not glorious. So it's the different meaning of even the E flat major works that he had composed before. So it's a culmination and a little bit of a changing in the meaning of the E flat major as a key. 
and then after that section is actually my favorite section of um, this blooming kind of um, into of the theme with this peaceful kind of accompaniment. And if you can think about this harmony, right? That the initial motif that began the first movement here bring you to five to this peaceful, heavenly kind of moment. So it's really amazing how he transforms what begins the first movement into something just completely different. Um, and then, okay, so that's the example of the E flat major. And then there comes the large section of this So this trill, long trill business, um, we have to talk about. Now I think I can just stop sharing. Um, I've been trying to find some kind of resources about you know, why he did that. And I have yet to find very solid um, evidence of why he did it. My speculation is related to the article I just shared, something to do with his deafness. So, you know, you can't hear something, but you can still feel something, right? Especially a vibration of a sound. So that's something that you physically feel, not so much with the pitches. And also, Gabriella Lena Frank talks about the physical motion. So when you are doing tri trill, this is going on, right? This physical motion is going on. And that could be also the reason, you know, something that he could feel on the piano. And so the feeling of oscillation and then the vibration of the sound and something that is just detached from this world and using something that was so mundane, like that, turning it into something that is so much more than that, right? And to me, it's sort of like a, like a cloud or a bridge into um, another world like heaven or something in the sky that you don't experience in this world. So that's how he uses this high register extended trill that is very unusual because no other composer does this. Nobody did this before Beethoven or after Beethoven. So that is to me the transcendental quality and aspect of how he overcame his own personal agony and adversity and using everything that he had done before with his piano sonatas and just lift us up. And then I think at the end of the piece, he almost goes to heaven, but to me, it's like he's back down on the earth. Johannes, I think, thinks like he went to heaven. Is that right? <laughs> you think he went to heaven? <laughs> but I think he almost goes there here. But then he goes down. So to me, it's like he is finally at peace with himself mm -hmm. and the world and the agony around him. So that's what I was thinking this whole year. How do I make peace of the situation with this year that has been so cruel to us? And what do I do? So what I try to do is just doing something a little bit meaningful for myself, maybe for my students or people around me. So that's why I started doing the YouTube and um, joining this Duminar and concert series. So yeah, that's what I wanted to share about the Opus 111. Thank you for having me, Johannes. And Thank you everyone for joining.
Don't forget to subscribe. <laughs>